Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's been a lovely um, uh, little convention, very uh, intimate. So I'd like, to take, I'd like to start this talk by dedicating uh, my presentation to the late Sasha Shulgin, who passed away earlier this year, in June. <laughs> and uh, the lesser known uh, early pioneer in psychedelic therapy, uh, uh, Christina Groff, who also passed away in June this year. So um, my name is Kelly, Kelly Opie Tavalari, and I am a scientist. I work at the QE in London. I'm involved in pathology. So as with most people, I like traveling. And on my travels, I come across many novel and interesting substances and animals. And I bring these back, I try to bring these back when I come back into civilization and discuss them in the medical and scientific community. Um, and I come across many misconceptions uh, when discussing certain plants and animals, uh, especially with, with substances that are usually auxiliary to more prominent teacher plants like ayahuasca and peyote. So um, I found that these, these plants and these substances had uh, many uh, p potential medicinal uh, applications in medicine. And, uh, and I wanted to dispel these misconceptions about these plants and animals and substances and become a sort of ambassador of knowledge and bring back the knowledge that these plants and substances ha have to offer. So one of the first uh, superstars of, of today is this little uh, critter here, um, also known as Phila Medusa. Uh, to the indigenous, it is known as Kembo or Sapo, and it's basically the frog medicine we hear about. Now, usually, sorry, God. usually when discussing uh, frog, the words frog and medicine together, people have misconceptions and they think of this. Well, <laughs> yes, licking a cane toad, an Australian cane toad, can result to hallucinatory, hallucinatory effects, but can also result to unpleasant effects such as death. <laughs> so... Um, Philomedusa has been around, although it's kind of a novel concept in, in the community, in the therapeutic and psychedelic community, it has been around for quite a while. And this gentleman here, uh, any of you um, know, have done your homework, is Vittorio Sparma. And uh, with, with funding from uh, Pharmitalia back in the 1970s, he conducted, uh, conducted extensive research on the secre secretions of Philomedusa. And this, his studies concluded him to, to quote this, um, that sorry, yeah, Cambo is a fantastic medical cocktail uh, with potential medicinal applications unequal to other, an, uh, other amphibian. Now, he found dozens of active peptides that could assist us and, and had medical applications, but I only re refer to a couple which don't seem to be there because we've had uh, a problem with PowerPoint. So anyway, with some, one of these, some of these, a handful of these, which would be interesting for you to take back and to know when you're discussing frog medicine, is one is full of medusin, and this is the substance that contributes to that purging effect that you have when you're in the um, um, campo ceremony. The other is philokinin, and this is a vasodilator like philomedusin is. Uh, it also facilitates for the swift transport of these biopeptides to the brain, so it passes the blood-brain barrier. Uh, Carolin and Sanvangine, these uh, result in hypertension and high tachycardia, and so they uh, stimulate the adrenal cortex and pituitary glands, and they have uh, potential for people who are suffering renal colic and pain as well. Um, there's um, deltoelfin and delmorphin, which are uh, opioid, um, uh, delta opioid uh, peptides, and they are many times stronger than morphine, yet the body seems to tolerate them better. Uh, and there's uh, less addictive potential with these substances. Um, and lastly, there's uh, adrenoregulin, which is a newer peptide that was discovered. And it works on the adenosine receptors uh, of the cell, um, which, is uh, which is ubiquitous to uh, cell uh, fuel. And they found that this can have potential applications for, uh, for um, cell regeneration for people who are experiencing uh, degenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, so let's take a closer look at, uh, at this frog. Uh, okay, yeah. And what, what Philomedusa really is and how... <coughs> it's the... Yeah, it's that one. So 
I, I often find that sometimes visual portrays the truth better than uh, than uh, the the um, verbal the spoken word. <laughs> okay. So basically, here we go. It's okay. Basically, it's an essential part of the culture of these people, the Matsus people. Okay. Here we go. Please enjoy. And they're also known as the jaguar people because they adorn themselves with facial piercings and decorations to look like jaguars. Um, they are also the guardians of Philomedusa, along with another couple of tribes, the Kashinawa and the Yanomami. Um, the uh, the matsus they use the, the frog medicine. It's ubiquitous medicine that they use. It's very sacred for them. And they use it as hunting medicine, as a vaccine, which is also known as the vaccine of the forest. And they use it uh, to dispel uh, the spirits and for parasites, which uh, I have personal experience uh, as a potential application. I was recently in Indonesia and I contracted a gastro um, um, parasite. And no, uh, nowhere in the NHS w was I able to get the medication that I needed, but I partook in, in a ceremony recently and I'm still well. So um, that's one of the medicinal potentials. Um, so this is how they harvest it. The, the frog is really sacred and contrary to popular belief, they don't harm the frog when they're harvesting as you saw. It's, very, it's actually considered a grave offence to harm the frog. Um, they'll harvest it, uh, they'll harvest a campo during a full moon, which is at its, at its most potent. And uh, what they'll do is they'll um, exaggerate the limbs of the amphibian and the, str the stress the, the amphibian, uh, amphibian undergoes will actually make it secrete the gland, secrete uh, the substance, this maxi, uh, waxy milky substance, which we know as uh, cambo. Um, then it's, it's, uh, Dave, <laughs> yeah. yeah that, so it's harvested using a wooden spatula delicately whilst they're singing Icaros to the frog. And then it's dried on a stick and it's stored for future ceremonies. Now the application is really simple. Um, and the, um, the initiate or the participant before the ceremony, the only thing they have to do is adhere to a kind of a strict diet, no fatty foods, no, no salts, no sugar. And ideally the night before they will totally fast and then just before the ceremony, you will be asked to drink copious amounts of, wa of a water, and that will facilitate the purging experience that comes on nearly immediately after the consumption, after the application of the medicine. And this is how they apply it. They use a glowing stick, a burning stick, and they burn little holes uh, on, their, on their arms and possibly on the legs for women for aesthetical purposes. And then they will rub the wounds, rub that clot, and then apply the medicine on there. And the effects are immediate, and um, you'll experience a purging and, and a release of, of toxins that last, uh, then the whole uh, ceremony lasts approximately 20 minutes. Um, so Campo, as you see, this is how it's earned its, its title as the vaccine of the forest. And it leaves you, it's also another p potential medicinal application is that it, it kind of heightens your immune system. And again, I have experience in that. I came back from, fr from the Amazon and although I work in, in a hospital uh, environment and I'm exposed to many pathogens, I was immune for a year. And uh, I, again, this repeated it. I repeated this uh, this year, and I found it to be exactly the same. So more studies are needed in regards to that, in regards to the immunoglobulins that are involved, and the reaction, the immune reaction that's involved. 
but there's a controversy around this uh, because uh, Brazil has banned the, uh, the use of, of uh, filamidusin and uh, there's also another contra controversy surrounding uh, filamidusin and that's because it's found the, the, the Matsus tribe and the Kashinawa uh, are, are primarily found in a place called uh, Block 135 in the Amazon. And uh, currently at the moment, we'll discuss this a bit later, but currently at the moment there's um, uh, surveys going on to uh, mine oil um, uh, in the area uh, from a conglomerate called uh, uh, Pacific Rubialis. So um, my next little guest, here we go. So this is the vaccination of the forest, like I said, this is how it happens. Uh, and the, uh, the potential medicinal uses is a plenty for Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, for the immune system, for heightening strength, for the awareness. So uh, they're limitless, but, uh, <laughs> but we're um, experiencing this sort of um, f uh, freezing of the studies of research. So our next little uh, guest star today is rape or snuff. Again, if you've partaken in any ceremonies uh, with the teacher plants, you will find this acting as, a, as an auxiliary. And uh, you'll see a lot of uh, shamans actually partaking in it. And the misconception with rape uh, or snuff or polvo as it's known, is that it's, uh, it's hallucinatory and uh, it is not. That is Yopo, which is a, t a totally different thing, and it contains uh, DMT. So, um, how did Rape end up uh, in the east, in the in the west? Well, it was first documented uh, by a monk called Friar Ramon Pan, and he, uh, when he went, he, he travelled with uh, Columbus on the second journey to the New World, and he witnessed the ta Taino and Carib tribes of the Lesser Antilles uh, consuming this substance uh, of uh, pulverised herbs and ashes, uh, and and they were they were insufflated using pipes, which the Kashinawa know as as a uh, teepee. So. Um, this is not a picture of the monk. I couldn't find a picture of the monk, but they all look alike, so I thought I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd show you what they used to look like when they were there. So I, his return triggered a, a, a concession of events that, uh, that would change the history of Europe and the world forever, because this heralded the arrival of tobacco and snuff in Europe and subsequently the rest of the world. And I like to think of it as poetic justice because we gave them scarlet fever, we gave them chicken pox, we gave them uh, a, um, a variety of diseases and they gave us tobacco. So it was kind of a, a, a good exchange, I don't know. Um, immediately it became very popular throughout Europe and, and subsequently it was banned but that never stopped anybody from taking uh, substances so it was very popular uh, from, e from all the classes of, of the people from lower to the very echelons of, 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 of the high society. Um, so here we go. Um, it's so popular nowadays. Unfortunately, we've been having problems with the PowerPoint. So it's so popular nowadays that they even hold rape or snuff championships, and they're very competitive. They're international and they're very competitive. So why rape? What does and again? Yeah, if you they compete in snuff. And they compete in the quality. They, they compete on how much they can take. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's kind of a, a competitive sort of, a, and just to um, identify the quality or what type it is and what it might contain. And they hide the snuff and then they will, the, the contestants will go about and they'll sniff it and they'll say, well, these plants are involved and this is involved and tobacco is involved. They'll evaluate the quality of the, of, the, of the herbs and the plants. And it is a very, very competitive environment. Uh, and I, do, I think little do they know of the history of it up and where it came from, which is basically in the middle of the Amazon. So it's nice to know these things. Um, there seems to be evidence that it can help with tobacco addiction. Uh, people who have a problem with smoking too much, if you use it up, it seems to lessen that, that urging, for, for that craving for nicotine. It also helps you focus, again, uh, acting as an auxiliary in ceremonies, especially with ayahuasca. Sometimes thinking, things can get a bit hazy and a bit crazy. And it helps you focus. It kind of brings you down and brings you back into your body. And I have, again, personal experience in this. It also helps regulate the blood, uh, the um, hypertension that you experience during uh, ayahuasca, and also the temperature of the blood. It kind of helps you cool down and sort of get back into your body. 
Again, they'll use it for parasites <coughs> and anti-inflammatory. And there's testimonies to it being able to decalcify the pineal gland. But I can't testify to that. This is just something I came across during my research. It cleans the sinuses. It is uh, a nice little auxiliary to have around. Um, so finally, this is my personal favorite. It's Sananga Tabana Montana. And uh, it is also known as ayahuasca drops or bechet, yeah, uh, or colirio indigena, which is indigenous uh, uh, eye drops. And uh, it comes from a plant known as Tabernal Montana, uh, uh, named after, obviously, Jacob Theodos Tabernal Montana. Now, that, that title might seem familiar because you come across it uh, with Ibogaine, and we'll discuss that later on. And this is, uh, keep in mind, this is another continent and another um, uh, echo, echo environment. So it is a perfect plant. It is an, an, an androgynous plant. Uh, and for my um, glossophile friends, it's uh, a, an aposinaceae plant, which means that it pollinates itself. So it's a very beautiful plant. It's very fragrant. Uh, why ayahuasca drops? Again, you'll find it during ceremonies. And uh, um, ayahuasca drops, they use them uh, to see better for hunting, also for infections and for parasites and inflammation. The, the indigenous will rub it in with latex and water, and, and they'll keep it and they'll apply it as, as for wounds as a disinfectant. Um, Again, during my research, there we go, that's how they apply it directly. What they do is they squeeze the sap of the, of the, of the plants directly into the eye, and the effects are immediate. You'll get the stinging, and then uh, the, uh, your vision seems to uh, improve dramatically, and the heightened sense of, of awareness and, <coughs> and connection with the environment around you, which also can be, can be of, greater, of great help in, during ceremonies, ayahuasca and, and, and peyote ceremonies. Um, during my research, um, here again, here's, here is how it's applied. As you can see, directly the, the, the leaf of it, not the flower of the plant, is directly applied into the eye. And this is the original version of it. You'll probably get the, the not the synthesized, but people seem to be bringing it in from the jungle and they'll mix it in with water and you'll probably get people trying to sell you ayahuasca drops. And maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Uh, but this is the, um, the way to go. This is the original way to go. Like I said, it's indicated for parasites and it's indicated for infections. Now, one of, the, yeah, one of the primary active ingredients I found is ibogaine. And um, this, is, this, this plant is found, it's is, is kind of the same, it, well, it's the same molecule as we find in, in the plants that, that we were discussing uh, yesterday. And I found that um, this uh, can open up a whole new field of ibogaine research because it's a totally different kind of a genus, and yet it, it contains ibogaine. So possibly for um, further research, maybe it might be more toler uh, people can tolerate it more, you know, using when they're doing ibogaine um, therapy. Um, it's a very recent discovery. They studied it, the, the, the medicinal applications of, of, of uh, Sananga uh, were basically documented as late as 2008. So it's not something that they've been studying li uh, like the, the Ibogaine that we find in Africa. And finally, before I conclude, I'd like you to draw your, to your attention to the main superstars of, of my presentation and basically why I'm here and what I'm representing. If it's anything that you take along with you, is the fact that the Matsus tribe and the other tribes, the Kashinawa and the Yanomami, have been living in, in this block, this beautiful block of, 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 uh, of land. Please. Here they are, they're called the Jaguar people. They adorn themselves and they're living on... Can you please... Uh, so they live in complete harmony with their environment. They're not in <coughs> abject poverty. Uh, abject poverty is usually, usually associated with, with rubbish and everything these people um, um, use, uh, the environment around them, they're in complete harmony. So they're a very, very advanced group of people. Um, they're not living in abject poverty and they're not, um, they're not um, at all, yeah. As you can see, I, I, I always, it always takes me, it makes me breathless just watching them and, and, and seeing how they, they live. And they live in this block of, of, of land. Go, go, David. So here, as you can see, there is no rubbish. Everything is recycled. It's perfect harmony environment. There's a very, very structured sort of a, a social, um, highly, highly structured social structure there. So. 
Okay. So here we go. Here's block 135, and I'll show you exactly on the map where it is. It's a very important block of land. And it's also a, a border to the, uh, the last, some of the last uncontacted tribes in the world who won't come and talk to the white people, but they will talk to the Matsurs. And what they are saying is, here's, one, here's block 135, and it's actually smack in the middle of the Amazon. We've got Peru and we've got Brazil. And we've got this, this major conglomerate called Pacific Rubialis who are at this time conducting surveys to mine. And so they've already started, as you can see, they've already started in bits and pieces of deep Amazon and deep jungle. And what their plans are is to uh, mine the rest of, of the Amazon. And um, obviously this will amount to losses of thousands of species that we have yet to discover that these indigenous tribes are privy to. And that the knowledge that they bring for the uses that they, uh, the use of these plants and these animals, which we really have no knowledge about, just as ayahuasca, we wouldn't have known how to use it. But these indigenous tribes had been using the concoction for many years, and they knew how to work the plants with harmony. There are potentially many other plants and many other animals in in, in uh, this part of the world that we know nothing about, and yet these tribes have the very sacred knowledge about. So uh, this is. Here we go again. This is a, a clearer map of where we are. It's, it's a very deep and, and preserved and virgin part of the world. And this is where they're, they're going to mine. This is tantamount to ecocide and genocide. And the, um, the blood will be on our hands because, and they know this, the conglomerates play along with this. Not that the, that the, that the blood of, of the world, of, of Yeah, will be on our hands, but the fact that it's in such a light, an isolated area that, and we're so distant from it that, they, that we won't be doing anything to, to stop them from their greed and, and their selfishness and the destruction that they're causing. And one of the major issues, uh, I, a question that I asked my friends yesterday, is so if a tree fell in a forest, would you hear it? No, well, well, if a pipe broke in a forest, a massive pipe, would we see it? No, we wouldn't. But we would feel the consequences later on. We would be, be depriving ourselves of potential medicines that could alleviate suffering, such as Alzheimer's and dementia, not to mention the psychological um, uh, diseases that we have, such as addiction and the disc discommunication and dis um, the, the splitting of the earth, uh, of, of our connection of the earth uh, with the earth. So these are uh, medicines that have this kind of potential that we'll be missing out on. So basically, yeah, thank you, everybody. I hope you do take that back with you, the, the fact that this part of, of Earth is in danger. It's called Block 135, and this, and this conglomerate, this giant monster, is, is basically committing ecocide and genocide. And, and we're all a part of it uh, with our silence in some way or another. So thank you. That's <laughs> I, I would, I'd like to apologize because we had a bit of um, uh, of trouble with our PowerPoint presentation, uh, <coughs> but I hope we got the message across in regards to these non-psychedelic entheogens. And the reason I meant I um, I termed them non-psychedelic entheogens is because they do generate the divine within. They do generate a deep connection with the earth, and they also heal on a medical and scientific, uh, you know, level. So, any questions? Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's like, yay, no questions. <laughs> um, for the um, one short question is, is um, in Hapei, is there a back contained always or something? No. Uh, no. The thing is, each tribe, each individual tribe, and this, ha this happens to be something common that they, they all use around that part of the, uh, of the Amazon. Now, each tribe has different constituents that they'll put into their rapé, and for different situations, it's a very social event using an rapé. It's, it's, it's like having coffee or a cigarette, and they'll sit around the fire and they'll use it. And for each event, they'll have a different kind of rapé, I found, or rapé. Sometimes they'll use tobacco, and it's more of a stimulant. Sometimes they'll use ferns, and it's very sacred to them. They'll, they'll put it in the middle of their gardens, in the middle of their villages, and they'll keep it very sacred and very hush-hush. They won't expose to the outsiders what's actually going on in there. And hopefully uh, next year or in, in a couple of years, I'm planning to go down and, and collect specimens just to take a closer look and see what's, uh, what's, in, what's in, the, in the rape. They'll keep them in the past. They were so, it was so sacred, the rape for them, and it still is, I guess, in some ways. Well, it is. <coughs> um, they used to keep them in ornate uh, bone bottles that they used to 
carved from the animals they used to hunt in the jungle. And it's, it's, it's almost um, equal to money and finance in, in the jungle. It's a very, very sacred thing. Yeah, very social, I found, yeah. Yeah. Um, Cambo to be just um, very um, painful. Uh, I vomited and uh, it took me a whole day to recover from it. And then two days later, I got sick. You got so sick. It's actually pretty much the opposite of what I was told would happen that I would feel stronger and that I get an, uh, like a vaccine or vaccination from it. You see, for me, and I don't, don't quote me on a scientific level about this, but for me it sounds like it was actually pushing out something that was initially in your body anyway. Because it does take pathogens sometimes a, a great deal of time from two to five, anyway, from two to five days to actually manifest through the body. And maybe the, the um, gamba was pushing out this um, illness or this pathogen that you had in your body. It works on the lymphic system a lot. It works, on, it works with the bile, it works with the stomach, and you literally find yourself really trying to purge everything out and clean everything out but uh, what they found also is with AIDS patients who have T cell count problems it kind of press it kind of resets the the immune system and their T cell count just goes sky high and this is the first time that they, they, these AIDS patients come back these people that are living with AIDS because they're not patients these are people living with HIV AIDS come back to the West and their doctors witness a higher T cell count like they've never seen before but again the uh, the controversy surrounding Block 135 and the issues of biopiracy that that the countries have have sort of suspended studies on that you know level so um, I mean we've yeah so a short question concerning Cambo as well um, I'm a physician and um, uh, I was uh, offered Cambo recently but I couldn't uh, make it to go there so I'm still anxious to know uh, how it uh, actually feels and I'm really I'm pretty much interested in it but I, um, I have a concern because um, um, as far as I know most uh, plant medication, sacred plants, teacher plants, or whatever you get out of nature, you apply on surfaces, like uh, <coughs> you swallow something, you smoke something, you put it on your skin or in your eye. But uh, this is a parenteral application form, so it goes directly into your bloodstream, and there's a certain risk to get uh, allergic reactions, which, uh, do you know something about I that? Do, I do. I think it's up to each individual to sort of do research before they're actually involved in, in any kind of um, medicinal um, activity involving their own bodies. Now, there's a tendency in the West when, when people, especially young people, they go and they have these experiences and then they come back and they bring back the medicines with them without actually having any knowledge because they're so keen to bring back the, the, the medicine to the West that we, that we find this kind of dissemination of, of the medicine without the actual sort of fundamentals of it. So again, this is why it's good, it's good to bring out these, these, these substances that, are, that do have kind of potential but we've not been able to study. Um, yeah. Again, for the allergic reaction, I mean, some of, most of the, the biopeptides that we referred to, um, I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I would suggest to people if they're going to partake in any kind of a ceremony like this or any kind of, uh, of medical um, sort of intervention like this on themselves, to do uh, thorough research and to not be sort of uh, tempted to uh, go to their friends and have the, do the... Um, the, uh, the um, the Cambo, but to actually go and travel into the Amazon and just see the environment. I think it's a combination of a whole lot of things that that's, uh, that you know happens and it's involved. Also, but also on that note, you can actually get a an allergic reaction to basically walking down the street, and for some reason you pass by a plant and you've got an, an allergic reaction. So again, yeah, more research is needed. It's true that you need to 
sting yourself in a way. Only by touching you don't get this kind of allergic reaction. Which, which well, is maybe that's why they don't consume it to be <coughs> more invasive, that it's kind of sort of, uh, in you've, you, what you've got is the glands and everything kind of pushing everything out. So you will get a kind of a weeping, but it will also sort of be a purgative sort of a thing. Your body's actually rejecting it. It's very, very strong and invasive, along with the other biopeptides that are involved with it, which actually sort of uh, uh, have a, synerg a synergetic effect uh, with, with the body. So I can't imagine it being that much of, a, of an allergic rea an invasive allergic reaction. I think of it more as a, a, an immune stimulant. Um, again. Yeah, well, yeah, I know it's, it's, but not immune stimulant as in uh, it, it uh, um, triggers an Im immune response to certain kinds of a peptide. Um, but a general immune trigger where the, it enlivens the, the B in the T cells and uh, sort of prepares your body better to be better able to handle pathogens rather than it being something specifically directed to a certain sort of peptide. I don't know if that makes sense. A kind of a stimulant rather than it being a specific immunological reaction because you, you become immune to pathogens that they don't necessarily find in the jungle. So I was within the NHS, everybody was getting this flu, this, um, you know, winter flu and the summer flu, and I was practically immune. I did come up with the sniffles a bit, but I was not, uh, not, not you know, sick in any way like the other people were. Um, more study, yeah. Hi. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, I have to cut my, um, the la lovely lady with you. but. I be, sorry, I didn't cut. Yes, there is a procedure again. I, we had to cut out talk short because um, uh, I have to share my slot with another lady. But yes, there's a process to actually becoming immune, and uh, you usually have to apply it three times in a span of three months, and you do that every one or two years. So I'd really like for you to look into that with the ibogaine thing because I think uh, Cam said the ibogaine that the the ibogaine that you get is from the roots in in uh, uh, Africa, but here the ibogaine that they're detecting is in the leaves of the of the plant. So it's kind of it's really interesting. It's called Tabernacle Montana Sananga or Undulata, and it looks like a. Uh, it looks like a, a little jasmine and it smells like a beautiful nightshade. It's very easy to detect. It's very ubiquitous within that basin, but the knowledge and the use behind it is, uh, the, is kept by the indigenous and the guardians of, of this, this, you know, this, this space. So it would be nice for you to visit and see because they probably have applications that we know nothing about, but we're wiping these people out and these tribes out and we'll never find out. So, anything else, anybody? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.